think we're uh, behind schedule somewhat. Um, if if Vianne could help me, uh, <laughs> let me know when we're running down, running a, running out of time. That would be fantastic because I'm sure. I think uh, you don't need me to introduce these two amazing, uh, amazingly active, productive, and um, just all-round fantastic social entrepreneurs. Uh, today's uh, uh, workshop is all about um, uh, the work of social entrepreneurship. Now, I have to say I'm not sure whether I'm qualified at all to talk about uh, social entrepreneurship since I'm a religion guy, not a, not a, I don't think much about business. But I'm going to leave it to uh, Francis and David to share their insights. And I want, uh, I want to let them speak to you directly. So I think we could start possibly with David first and um, describe a little bit about uh, what you're doing with Green Monday. Uh, I'm sure I myself am very well acquainted with Green Monday, but you can talk about more what you're doing right now. Um, I, I prepared some slides, um, but at first, I guess, put uh, Green Monday. I'll, I'll do a very quick version of it. <clears throat> Okay. Um, for anyone who has not heard of Green Monday or may not have the full background of Green Monday, and now obviously when, when we are talking about social venture or social enterprise, we are trying to address issues, not just creating a hopefully profitable business, um, but using the business to address social problems. In our case, we are talking about arguably the biggest problem that the planet is facing, and all 7.7 .7 billion people are facing, and that is climate change. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. We have 11 years before we hopefully uh, reverse or at least minimize the damage of climate change before it becomes a complete runaway train to get past the point of no return. Um, this is the line or the point of no return, which is compared to pre-industrial days, if our temperature on average rise above the 1.5 degree line, then basically the planet is finished. These will be the common things that happen on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. The planet basically will become unlivable. So that is the line we are, unfortunately, we are raising towards that line right now. In fact, the trajectory is we are accelerating towards that line. So it's kind of like that's the end of the cliff and this is the train, it's a runaway train that actually is speeding up as we head towards the cliff. That is collectively what we are facing. So that's the little issue that Green Monday is trying to address. Now, obviously, energy, I think most people know, car carbon footprint come from energy, carbon footprint come from transportation. But one major, very important sector that a lot of people do not realize create a lot of environmental damage is the livestock industry. So from a carbon footprint standpoint, if cattle, just cattle, if cattle were a country, cattle would be the third largest cattle. Cattle would be the third largest country in terms of carbon emission slightly behind the US and behind China, that's it. So if we want to not cross the point of no return, that 1.5 degree line, this is the re research led by Oxford scientists, which is we need to reduce our meat consumption by this much. We need to reduce pork by 90%, beef by 75, 
poultry, 60%, dairy, 60%. That's the dramatic change in diets that we need to have in order to not fall off the cliff. Now, nowadays, because humans are consuming so much meat, we are raising, on one hand, we have 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. But on the other hand, we have a lot of animals. A lot of animals. Just China alone has 700 million pigs. Just China alone. Now, when these animals have to live in such crowded environment, and we put so much chemicals like antibiotics and hormones and and things in the animals, virus and a lot of health, health issues become inevitable, which is why there is African swine fever right now. No one has any idea how many millions of pigs have already died. So, and finally, there's a health issue. Anyway, so what Green Monday does is we keep innovating in every way possible in every way possible to try to change people's diets. So we try every way possible from culture to experience to options from to food technology to try to give people new options. So First of all, Green Monday, which is a framework for people to follow, you know, one day a week. Of course, you can do more than one day a week. The more, the better. But that, is, that allows a framework for companies, for schools to all join in together. Because going green is a concept, but people need concrete action. They need a framework to follow. Just like when we say, oh, let's go exercise, let's go run. But then whoever create marathon give you a framework to follow. So Green Monday is, first of all, a social innovation when it comes to creating an actionable framework for people to do sustainability activity. And then the second part of the innovation is we got to give people more options. Talking about the problem alone will not solve the problem. We need solutions. And food is such an experience thing because we eat food more than just to, you know, f make sure that we are not hungry. But food is part of our culture. Food is social, and food is emotional. So creating a new destination to make it convenient for people to understand what the new plant-based food is about is very important. And that's why we have Green Common. Now, after having these shops and restaurants, what do we sell? Now, you're not just going to sell salad and tofu. If we try to just convince people and say, give up meat and eat salad every day, at least in Asia, that won't work. Um, we don't prefer raw food. Um, you know, so coming up with innovative food products is very important. And that's where we have something like Omnipork, which is our own food innovation. And this is you know, it cooks, it tastes, it works just like pork, except it is made from plants. And in fact, it is a better pork because all the things from a nutritional standpoint is better. What you need, you know, protein, calcium, iron, um, omni pork gives you plenty of it. And what you don't need, such as fat, calories, and cholesterol, there's zero cholesterol in omni pork. And we now are working with hundreds and thousands of restaurants on a daily basis in terms of bringing it to the market and in supermarkets as well. And then from other parts of the world, we're bringing in some of the most exciting and innovative products, Beyond Meats being the most iconic of them. Um, this is a company that is invested by Bill Gates, by Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, by Tyson, which is the leading meat company in the world. And most recently, by uh, professional basketball superstars such as Kyrie Irving, who is still active, um, and retired stars such as Shaquille O'Neal. Now, the idea is 
same story, which is when you're eating a Beyond Burger or a Beyond Hot Dog.、Um, Everything is better from a nutritional standpoint, and it tastes great. So all together, I mean, all together, this is the Green Monday story. Is we are trying to tackle this food problem from a 360 point of view, whether it is a culture, whether it is a destination, whether it is a food product or food innovation. How do we mobilize people to switch their diet towards a plant plant based sustainable diet? So. Uh, we can talk more about it, but this is kind of the holistic, very high-level view of why we need a social venture collectively called Green Monday. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, very detailed but、um, succinct tour of what、uh, Green Monday and Green Common are up to.、Um, so, I th- before we open the floor to some sort of dialogue,、yeah. uh, shall we?、Uh, Talk about what a little bit about the social entrepreneurships that you have created, Francis, and、uh, we can talk about how the co- how the concepts all interrelate、uh, soon after you finish. Thank you.、Um, I'm Francis from Social Ventures Hong Kong. So、um, SVHK founded since 2007. So we have the privilege to work on many different issues in Hong Kong. We go deep dive in Hong Kong issue. So I think、um, in the last journey of、um, 12 years around. We have、uh, incubated for more than 40 different social ventures,、so、ranging from our diamond cab, which has accessible taxi. Green Monday, we involve we involve more in the, at the early stage. So Light B is the very first affordable housing initiative,、um, uh, and also、uh, Run Our City. We promote running in Hong Kong. We trained more, over 10,000 youth to go on long distance runs, which is、uh, making big impact to the public health and also the motivation of the youth. And then、uh, recently, we have a project called Bartless. We try to reduce the plastic waste in Hong Kong and one-time use habit. And also, we have、um, uh, for one year we have a new factory project. We call it co-working factory. We try to bring manufacturing back to Hong Kong. So I think、uh, on the other side we do a lot of women empowerment. So since、um, David has covered a lot on the planet issue, I will、um, go more into the people side in the society. So、uh, I think if、um, Green Common is a place that、uh, we、uh, work on the earth issues. Getting、uh, people adopting to a plant-based、um, diet. So I would say、uh, SHK. We trying、uh, so hard in the last ten years in trying to bring people to a good common. So I think we suspect many people would like to do good things, but I think just like the Green Monday is advocating right now, people need baby step. People need to do things much easier. So right now, apart from mobilizing impact investor come on board to have their capital play good. In the society, we collaborate with、uh, many, many different stakeholders: the government,、um, the、uh, business people, or even more traditional non-profit. We don't treat ourselves to be any of these sectors, but we are a connector. We are aggregator. I think Lightbe is a good example. We work on affordable housing. In case you are、um, not very often visiting Hong Kong,、uh, I have to tell you we have something called subdivided units. So many families right now living under squ- seven square meter. Ten square meter, so even in a very rich pay, place like Hong Kong, so it's not few thousand or few hundred thousands of them. I think it's、uh, more than two hundred thousand right now,、uh, living under s- such situations. So I think、uh, income gap is a huge issue in Hong Kong, and I would say it's not just about the absolute number. I think it's、uh, how the society is facing these kind of problems. So sometimes I would say,、uh, even some of the government official, I would say they they just put a blind eye to it. It's just a number. To them,、um, I don't see that as a good phenomenon going on. I hope I, I'm afraid one day we all see these issues to be normal, just like today when we are eating meat. Oh,、um, climate change is a big issue, but、um, the pork chop is de- delicious. So、uh, we separate it. So one day we just、um, see these poor phenomenon to be normal. That's my、uh, biggest afraid of、uh, what's going on now. So light be. Is an idea、um, from bottom up. It's not government drive at first, but I think we get some landlord rent their house to us without charge on market rent. We re-rent that to some single mom with the young kids、uh, who originally living in the subdivided units, very poor area, small area, and then hygiene, security problems, a lot of them. But I think our biggest issue with that is not the hygiene and security; it's actually the isolations. Many families living under such situations get emotional problem. 
the kids, uh, we moved our office to Sam Po, which is one of the places that very focused with these issues. Uh, we see families, their kids are uh, lagging behind, a lot of them. At age of two or three, uh, they don't speak because there's not a lot of um, place for them to um, interact with people. So unlike um, several tens of years ago, we have neighborhoods. But I think right now, Hong Kong, uh, we don't talk to people. We don't know our, our neighbor's name. So that's uh, the isolation problem in Hong Kong. So right now, um, that phenomenon, the light, house, light, light home, which is the product name, uh, we call it social housing or transitional housing, now is getting the attention of the mainstream. So from first apartment that we have uh, seven or eight years ago to right now ourselves, like home, we grow to over 120 apartments. So uh, at most they could live there for three years. It's not for long term. It's all private resources. It's not the public resources. So, but I think surprisingly still we keep um, all those more than 300 families being there before. Average living time right now is two years. So we prove one thing. Poverty is actually have an exit. That's the biggest discovery for us. It's not the affordable housing uh, vehicle, although it is uh, quite a significant thing in Hong Kong. Because in the past, we just got private and public to market. Uh, public housing right now, average waiting time is more than five and a half years. So I think it's, it takes a long time for a family to go into that. But I think right now, apart from ourselves, government replicating this case on transitional housing, and then many NGOs now replicating like B. So right now in the market, we have a brand new product called affordable housing or transitional housing or social housing. So that's from one thing. So that's leading to what I want to talk about social entrepreneurship is what is so, uh, the social enterprise is doing. One thing is the direct impact. We solve the problems of some families, but I think all the more, more important is to inspire the society or the whole market, like Green Monday. I would say right now, the direct impact created by David is important, but at the same time, we count it, right? The plant-based or vegetarian restaurants has been doubled at least in the last few years. We created the whole phenomenon. Uh, a big movement is going on. So like um, the affordable housing as well, so we want to inspire many more different sectors to be aware of that. The, new pro the importance of new inventions and new product in the property market it's important. But as I said, what's important is how we address the poor issue, the poverty issue. Globally, I think government tend to keep on finding money to give them welfare. Free money and free housing and such and such. But I would say what Light Home discovered is actually we should create an exit for the poverty. Many families, after living in Light Home, they co-live. They try to build up neighborhood and learn to live with each other. Sometimes 80% uh, of our exits is not going to the public housing, unlike the trans transition housing by the government. Uh, what we see is that when the women can live together, they could go out to co-live. Then they don't need to rent the subdivided units. Sometimes they just need some time, one, one year or two, to get them to um, adopt a better job, waiting the kids to grow, to grow older so that they could go out to work again. So with that, I think uh, that, that inspirations lead us to go into some sort of We work on something called uh, a grassroots clubhouse. Why the middle class or the, the rich got clubhouse, not the grassroots? So we build communal space to attract the families to come here, to build up relations. Um, they, we provide some play group for their kids, uh, all different kinds of services, whatever they need. It's just like, like a clubhouse service. It worked out quite well. And later on, we find out actually, at some days, these women need to work. So we need to work more on the livelihood. But in Hong Kong, I think all the jobs that they can reach out is uh, being a security guard or washing dishes at the restaurants or more, more low skill thing. So I think why not we try to build up the momentum with something else? Like several tens of years ago, we got manufacturing. But I think for, for a number of reasons, manufacturers moved to China. So actually a lot of the idle space is now still in the industrial building in Hong Kong. So we try to build up something called co-working factory. It's called Hatch, the, the projects, Hatching X like. So I think we get the women come here, we got a playroom over there so they could bring their kids to work. And at the same time, we tailor the hours. So each woman can have different hours to work on their own hours to take care of their families as well. But after that, actually, 
just within uh, six months, we see magic with all these women. They see different momentums. Apart from the work, I think we, every two weeks we get a social workers to have lunch with them, to even solve their family problems. So we bring them to go to see the city, which they do not have that kind of privilege before. So I think all the way, we see that women, actually, we, we, it's just some very simple intervention, a bit of work, can change them totally. So right now, we're seeing some of these women can even work on some micro-entrepreneurship. Um, many different brands right now try to get their orders back to Hong Kong. Uh, Heisen Grip, uh, we got Lane Crowe with a lot of the orders. Uh, decorations, they say, oh, in the past, several hundreds of them, uh, the products, um, they have to back for some factories in Sunton to do it. Right now, why don't we do it in Hong Kong? So we get Hong Kong to remanufacturing re again. But I think it's not the industrial 4.0. We don't just need the robot uh, arm to work on these things. We try to get the work to the women. Uh, work can be an empowerment tool to solve our poverty issue at the same time. So I would say um, increasingly we are um, seeing more opportunities for different people to come on board. Right now, many manufacturer, industrial people see that, oh, there is a chance that we can get the manufacturing done again. So if in the future, in the next 10 years, collectively all the social entrepreneurs in Hong Kong can create more tools. Then we can get different sectors, different capital, different network to work for good again. So that's uh, what SHK will be committed in the next 10 years. Um, today's uh, panel is about uh, showcasing stakeholders' considerations and challenges. And what struck me from both um, David and Francis's uh, brief introductions is that in, in, a, in a social enterprise or in the model of what you're doing, everyone wins. Everyone's a stakeholder, everyone is involved. David, you've outlined how um, when, you, when, you know, when I go get a Beyond Burger, I'm getting better food than if I went to you know, the burger shop you know, near Causeway Bay or whatever. Um, as you said, um, with, 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 the, with the housing, both landlords and tenants are they win they, they, they both both parties have a vested have a, have an interest in seeing this project flourish um, so uh, I guess um, my, my I'll lead with one question and then I'll open it to um, uh, the, the, the floor uh, when you t when you consider stakeholders what what do you see as your company's strengths and do you see any uh, anything you need to work on, potential weaknesses or something like that. Can we start with David? Yes, please. Okay. Um, stakeholders. Um, I will go beyond just the human beings, first of all. Um, I mean, for us, stakeholders is not just human beings, but all lives that live on the planet. And I think that is very important to today's topic, which is also about Buddhist value. So a very quick video on some of our, the stakeholders that we have in mind. Oh. 摔死有的是被压死然后有的被活活活烧死的时候
哋用與別不同嘅豬肉做出嚟嘅餸，街坊食落覺得點呢？豬肉，豬肉，我覺得係豬肉。其實咧，佢係素豬肉嚟嘅，佢唔係真豬肉。你覺得點啊 ？O K 喎，有豬肉嚟喎，有豬肉咯，覺得硬係。肉啊？我係我今年二零一九年最大嘅 surprise， 我真係不得不讚啊 ，David， 哇，好好食，唔係真係好食，我係樂意係每一個星期食一次呢啲咁高水準嘅嘅素食。So first of all,、uh, the last, the very last person. Any, I think a lot of people in Hong Kong know who she is. So see Wang, okay.、Um, she once claimed that there's no way she will even try one meal of vegetarian,、uh, any meal, lunch or dinner, because she's number one, she is a big meat lover, and number two, she is a big gourmet lover, and she thinks that vegetarian food, the quality is so bad that、um, you know there's no way she can. Find have one meal of vegetarian diets. In fact, we serve even some of the previous, you know, products. I mean, we try to send to her, and like her comments were beyond bad. <laughs> It was like she was she's extremely critical. So that time when she had Omni Pork, Hong Xiu Si Ji Tao, okay, which is a very traditional Shanghai dish using pork, but instead of pork is Omni Pork. Like she was blown away, and that's what she said live. On radio、um, to everyone who was listening. So now going back to your question about stakeholder,、um, we are in fact talking about every single living or even non-living being on the planet. Animals, of course, are a big part of that. Now we, you know, because of our exploding appetite for meat. Uh, and for dairy, I mean, we have been mistreating animals in a very inhumane and unimaginable way. Like, if anyone now, if you just go on YouTube and Google industrial farming or industrial dairy farming, I dare you, if you watch more than five minutes, like you will say, you want to give up meat or dairy completely because it's so gross. And so ridiculously inhumane, the way we treat these animals. So, I guess because this is, after all, about Buddhist value, right? Buddhist value and economics, how to invest in a sustainable future. I think I can use this topic for all my talks in the future.、Um, Buddhist Buddhism, right? When I first exposed to Buddhism, eighteen years ago,、um, my the first thing I found out was that. Buddhism doesn't need to be a religion. It is a philosophy about how to live a compassionate, meaningful, and joyful life. How to live the 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 life the meaning of life to the fullest. And in order to live the meaning of life to the fullest, the first thing you do is to live in the present moment. Maximize the positivity of the present moment. Now, as an entrepreneur. You know, we do a lot of things. You know, we we innovate, we create, we come up with ideas. But I think deep down, the roots of entrepreneurs is we solve problems. Now, there are a lot of things that we need to solve. You know, some people say, "Oh, I want to solve a problem that people are bored, so I want to create more games." You know, some a lot of people those are game entrepreneurs. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, people are bored. You know,、uh, let's give them more games. That's okay. I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But social entrepreneur is to really incorporate that Buddhist value, which is on one hand, be compassionate,、uh, be compassionate to all stakeholders, meaning all lives, 
And then on the other hand is not just to sit there and pray or to meditate, but can we actively alleviate their pain, alleviate their suffering, and increase their happiness? In Chinese, in Buddhist term, it's called lei fu dak lo, which is reduce pain, reduce suffering, add joy, add happiness to other beings. And one day, when I was looking at all these. Um, well, all these different dimensions of sho- social problems, but particularly environmental problems. I just thought to myself, if our planet collectively, if the situation continue to go down, we will all suffer more. <laughs> all the stakeholders will suffer more. So, sustainability, the industry of sustainability, really is almost like the s- industry for Buddhist economics. Which is applying daily econo- economic knowledge and entrepreneurial problem-solving mindset to reduce suffering and add joy and meaning to people. So um, when I made that connection, that was when I said, you know, I hope one day this is something that I could dedicate my life to. Now, very thankfully and very gratefully, I came across this guy, who is equally crazy when it comes to trying to solve.、Uh, well, actually, he was the first one who initiated. So he infected me with this social venture virus or bug. And then after I caught that bug, then truly that becomes the point of no return,、uh, in a good way. <laughs> That's the good point of no return, which is you found that every morning when you go to work. I mean, come on! This is a Sunday right now. What time is it? It's what almost eleven o'clock, ten thirty Sunday morning. Why am I here? I mean, I have two kids at home. He and he got kids at home.、Um, we have our boss, which is our wife, to attend to.、Um, it's a Sunday. I, I mean, we should be at home、uh, spending time with kids,、um, just doing what other people do, right? So why are we here? It really is about. Hopefully, maximizing the impact of every minute, every second, adding value to stakeholders, solving problems. So, the idea of Buddhism and economics to me, a lot of people think these are mutually exclusive things, but to me, they can absolutely be perfect aligned. And when it is indeed perfectly aligned, then every morning you go to work, or even on a Sunday, work doesn't feel like work. Um, one of the one of the best quote from this guy is, um, 每朝早叫醒佢嘅唔系闹钟，而系梦想。Ah,、uh, every morning what wakes him up is not the alarm clock, but the dream to make a better world. <laughs> Although I still need the alarm clock. <laughs> um, I'm not a Buddhist, but I suspect that、uh, all of us deep down we share some values. No matter you call it Buddhist value or not,、uh, so I think in the journey, I think we all、um, the fundamental big assumptions that we have. It's、uh, we suspect, or every one of us, want a better world. Or collectively, we might call it just as simple as a、uh, hope. But I think somehow, I think in the society, in our world right right now, many many of us is、um, losing it. We're trying to forget about it. We feel powerless. So I think that's、um, the single most important thing for、um, all of us, especially for social entrepreneur, is to re- rediscover the connections of all, of all of us. Try to get our values together. I can see that all of us can collaborate. Even your meat eater, I think you will be one day can be a vegetarian. It's just、um, the matter of how. So coming back to the stakeholder, we talk a lot of the, of that.、Um, you see the values of people. Deep down in their heart, no matter they deny it or not, but I think we have to get the optimism to try to keep pursuing for that, finding ways to get them come on board. So I think that comes to the part of、uh, in marketing we call consumer behavior or behavioral change.、Um, landlords, they ju- they don't they will not just donate the house to you, so we just rent it from them. So they w- will not be a ten years or five years. We just、uh, ask for three years. You try that out first. So even we will manage the maintenance for you, so it's hassle-free. We do, we will not run away because we are、um, being 
uh, watched by all the society people. So we are meant to be a good tenant. So all these things make it uh, make the landlord much easier to make a decision. So for the poor people, we also say that it's not a welfare. It's not meant to be, to be long term. We never get government funding. Uh, so it's all private. So they trash it every day. That make a magic for them to make a difference themselves as well. So I think uh, we just treat them as a tenant. So it's not a top-down thing. They don't feel their dignity pick, being taken away. So that's very important considerations. So when we are asking people to adopt to a vegetarian diet, like myself, I'm inspired by this guy. I'm now, now full-time. I start with one day. But I think you need change gradually. So we don't start with all those preaching. Uh, I think many people, after seeing all this clip, they will get inspired. But uh, when they see a pork chop, they will be, <laughs> they will be having a uh, different kind of thinking. But I think we need to create the same kind of good thing. So that's in the considerations of David. When they get these people, we need cool elements. We need delicious food. Get them on board first. But afterwards, try to preach them in the second, second place. On that. So I think that's all important considerations when we are talking to different sectors. But I think all the more, the first thing is uh, we have to take away all these labels. Where, which sectors we are coming from, what kind of status we have in the society, or even what kind of religions. Let's forget about it. We are all human beings. We are all people with hope. We are all people share the same visions about our future. I think that's the underlying thing that we have to believe. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much, David and Francis, for your very insightful um, comments on how you see stakeholders and partnerships. It's global, it's across all beings, and it's um, deeply personal. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Please feel free to um, ask questions concerning Buddhism and economics and this uh, stay. Oh, yeah. To the lady in the front first. Thank you, David and, and Francis. Uh, my name is Ken Seekong from uh, Social Enterprise. Uh, I'd like to bring um, what I heard this morning um, in, in the panel, uh, not the panel, the, the opening uh, on policy. I'd like to hear your views on policy. So David is very effective uh, in uh, putting actionable practices and um, I'm alerted by Francis' comment on let's not make uh, the phenomena um, you know, of poverty and other things as normal. I'm also very struck by the one slide that uh, David had, which he had, like just one second, and that is, um, you know, it's the new cigarette. Oh. So I remember, you know, with this, the, the um, harm of cigarette, it took years. So what are your views and maybe what are you already doing in terms of, you know, working with the government in terms of the policies to speed up and scale up you know, all these very, very urgent issues that we have. Thank you. We got uh, people from the policy making side. <laughs> um, I think they might be um, not the last, but I think um, the government, I think they're not meant to be a, a machine to invent. We always say it globally. It's not just Hong Kong. So I think they need examples. So uh, Light B, the, the affordable housing that I talked about, at first it's called Light Home. A few years back, I think we have another product as a spin-off we call Light Housing. We ran a government building underutilized at some Zhang. So we find some charity money to renovate it. And so immediately we get 45 more units from that. But I think if it is not that we have a few years of experience of Light Home, media spreading out, they see that, oh, it's a very good way to get people to live. And there's no danger in that. We cannot get that track record, go through the policymaker and say, oh, we can try an example. And then we have to think about the mechanism, as I said, the consumer behavior, including the government. You, you have to know what they are afraid of, what they want. They want the pol the something done, but they don't want the risk sometimes. So for that project in specific, we have to be the tenant. We ran the whole thing. So we are responsible for the whole building. We are responsible for the management. We are responsible for the PNL. So uh, with that, I think the government will say, oh, it's risk-free for me. So it's just your risk. Whatever um, happened, uh, bad or, or good, is, is you. 
good maybe is <laughs> they can share some of that. But I think uh, I I can sp speak it openly as well because uh, the government policy maker also see this the beauty of these kind of collaborations. So that very first public private social housing appeared in the market. But the government is quite uh, funny. After having one showcase, the other departments or all the government people can say, oh, there is a showcase already, so we can try it out. So after, after that, actually, we are approached by many different departments and say, hey, I got some underutilized premises as, uh, as well. So later on, Carrie Lam put that into the policy agenda. Social housing become one of the directions they will keep pursuing. So I think we need to find a way to crack the system. So the system, I think, not meant to be an, an evil. I think we have to treat people equal as well. We always say that we don't discriminate poor people, but all, we also don't discriminate the rich people or the policy maker, put it in that way. So we, we see them equal. We have to still believe deep down in the government official or the business people, they, have, they want to do something good. But I think we have to find ways to get them go over it. So Ocean Park, they will come on board if we get it right, the right dishes, the right pricing when we approach them. It's important. So the government, I think we have to find ways to work with them. Don't give up. We see people give up. Whatever you, do, you say, government, oh no, we stay away from them. Because they, they will build a, a new island in the, in the, in the land of Island. You, you're very against all that. But I think well, we need to keep the optimism. There are you, some you other ways that we can work with them. You want to get me started no, on that? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't you you. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop here first. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we need to find ways. As we, we said to some other stakeholders, when we collaborate with them, we need to... No one say we, when you do good things, don't, you don't think. When you do good thing, you have to think about ways and work with different people. Is it fast enough? Is it fast enough? No. Uh, I would say even our work is not fast enough because the problem is too severe. The capitalism engine is running too fast. So we, don't, we cannot just beg for anyone to work faster. So, uh, but I think equally, we don't just stand here and scold at someone. We have to keep going. Um, I think at least both of us, we share that baby step is important. What I'm trying to illustrate to my next generations, the only reason why we, I'm working on this is because of my kids. After having two kids, I start my social entrepreneurship. So I have to let them see that when you see problem, you don't stand still. You don't just point at someone. You work on your own. So I think collectively, if many more people get inspired, we get many people in the camp, we can get the engine run faster and faster. So that's the only hope that we can keep on pursuing. Um, to just add on the point about government, um, especially on climate or environmental issues, these are huge issues. So people generally feel powerless, and they think that you know, we'll wait for the governments to fix it. Sustainability will not be fixed by governments, uh, especially in today's world when many governments are dysfunctional. Donald Trump pulled out of Paris Agreement. Brexit, I mean, one week is this version, another week is another version. <laughs> are they in, are they out? <laughs> it is um, extremely discouraging. But on the other hand, you cannot underestimate the power of even one person. Um, the best example, most recently, is this 16-year-old girl named Greta Thunberg from Sweden. 16-year-old. Since about eight months ago, she has been doing a strike every Friday at the, outside of the parliament building of Sweden. And she is a 16-year-old school kid secondary school kid, high school kid. At the beginning, it was just her doing it solo, a very lonely, very personal act. But it caught media attention, it became a global story, and thanks to social media, when they finally decide to do the first ever student climate strike on March 15th, which was exactly one month ago, 1.5 million secondary school students came out for climate strike. 
and these people all say or pledge not just themselves but also you know spread the influence around their families around their friends to say that we got to take action together we are not going to wait for the governments we're not going to wait for the adults these kids are taking destiny in their own hands so when that happens i also feel highly encouraged now these kids are saying you know we are saying no to single use plastic they are saying no to dairy, to meat. They are saying no to a lot of things that are just harmful to the environment. Now, I actually will give you a very bold forecast that it, it may sound bold, but it is already happening. And I'm on camera uh, to give this forecast. I, in fact, I'm predicting the game over for the dairy industry is going to come very soon. Just like Kodak, just like Nokia. Now, you can go, why, why am I confident to say that? First of all, if all these kids, they, 5, 10, 12, 15 years later, they become the mainstream consumers. That's number one. You know, the 15-year-old today, 10 years later, 25, 30 years old, they are the main consumer group. That's number one. They become the biggest part of the consumer. When they raise their kids, they will tell their kids, you know, these are bad things, just like cigarette, just like smoking. Um, you know, 30 years ago, smoking was considered a cool symbol. Today, it's like, why are you even smoking? You know, please stay away from me. You know, it went from sexy to unattractive very quickly. Same thing, I think that will happen to meat, that will happen to dairy, especially when there are better innovations as alternative that will be available. So, and of course, when I say the game over for dairy may be coming, I'm not just going out on a limb. Everyone now, you can, go, you can do this afterwards. You can go check out a listed company in the US called Dean Foods, D-E-A-N. And the stock symbol is D-F, D-F. Dean Foods is the number one dairy company in the United States. They are the biggest dairy company. Two years ago, two years and three months ago, their stock price was trading at $22. $22 to another, two years and three months ago. Today, they are at $2.30. 22 to two thirty in two years. Their market cap dropped 90%. This is the number one dairy company in the United States. Another company that everyone has heard of is called Kraft, Kafu Zizi. Huge company. They have been dominating the industry for decades. Two years ago, the stock price was $96.95. Today, $35. It has dropped two-thirds of their market value in two years. Change can happen, and change does not have to happen with government support. We each has a vote. Each one of us has a vote. When we decide to buy something, when we decide to not buy something, when we decide to share the news to our friends, everyone has influence. Everyone can be a change maker. Uh, and when you can align those change makers together, just like a 16-year-old girl named Greta Thunberg, She's not Donald Trump, she's not Theresa May, but she is becoming immensely powerful, immensely influential, and she's now being nominated for Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, in fact. So I think government will always be slow and on the reactive end. Um, only very, very few forward-thinking governments um, foresee and anticipate problems. Um, I think some of the Scandinavia Scandinavian countries may be more forward-thinking. In terms of food, countries like Singapore and Israel are much more forward-thinking because they know food, they, can, they know they cannot take food for granted. A couple months ago, I'll tell you a story. We take food for granted, right? When you want to buy food, you go to supermarket, you know? And then when the price goes up a little bit, you are complaining. It's like, they are 
Why is it so expensive? A couple months ago, December, you can Google this news too. The egg supply in Singapore, eggs, 雞蛋, egg supply, dropped 40%. People were not able to buy eggs in Singapore. Like you must be thinking, like, what the heck? I mean, now Singapore is a rich city, egg is cheap. You cannot buy eggs? The reason is because we are just eating too much. Eggs come from what? I mean, this is a dumb question, rhetorical. Eggs come from chicken. Chicken are not machines. No matter how much junk, how much chemical you inject into these chicken hormones, try to make them, you know, you know, basically, it's like produce egg as efficiently as possible. They cannot produce fast enough. Malaysia, which is the biggest supplier of egg to Singapore, the chicken cannot produce eggs fast enough. So they say we are reserving the egg supply for ourselves. We are. They reduce their egg export to Singapore, and that's why Singapore egg supply dropped by forty percent. Same thing is happening in Taiwan right now. The planet is not supposed to sustain our endless demand and our endless greed. The planet is, is the same planet. It is not supposed to satisfy endless, boundaryless demand for everything, from clothes to food to whatever we consume nowadays. And we are at that breaking point. So I think only few governments, such as Singapore, such as Israel, such as maybe some of the Scandinavian countries, um, Hong Kong, unfortunately, the government is uh, absurdly reactive. Um, I don't even want to go into that. In terms of Dong Da Yusan, that's another, I want to make another forecast on camera, which is what. Whatever they anticipate, you know, whatever time they expect to finish this project, I think it will take infinitely longer time and it will cost way more. And I actually question whether the project will ever end because of climate change. Last year we had Typhoon Mankut, um, Sanjo, right? We are going to encounter storms and typhoons that will be 10 times worse than Typhoon Mankut's in the near future. So even existing land will be underwater. Like we can be talking about Hang Fa Chun, Gin Lei Dei Sing, hopefully not Hong Kong Da Hong Kong Da Hong San Zhang Bin, okay? Yeah, Hong Kong U is uh, on a hill. But if you talk about any of the coastal area, quite frankly, cities like Miami, Cities like New York, Manhattan, they are thinking about building um, this type of high-tech uh, dams that can avoid flooding, water to come into the city. They are building ways to block water from coming in to the city, not to build another island from scratch. 30 years ago, maybe it's a, it's an, it's a feasible idea. Today, it is honestly environmentally highly questionable whether this island can ever be finished. Because the storm that we see in 2029 will be way worse than the storm that we see in 2019. And Typhoon Mankut was already the worst storm Hong Kong has ever encountered. So if you look at the previous situation from an environment standpoint and say, oh, what worked back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, will work in the next 10, 20 years? Unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. So government is, in general, very much on the reactive end. Um, and you got to prove it to them. you got, you got to show it to them. And I think each one of us, as consumers, as business, we got to show it to them that this is the change we want. And then maybe they will pass a law. Um, but until then, we should take control in our own hands. Sorry, there's a gentleman on that side. Uh, there's two government projects that I've looked at having to do with housing. And one is done by a guy named James Law, and it's kind of a drainage pipe you made into a little home. 
Another one is called Intercell, and it's over in Science Park. <clears throat> and I asked both of them, when is it actually going to be open for people to live in it? And they said, well, we didn't do it for that. We did it because the government officials wanted us to do this, and they all were there to have their pictures taken. So how do we actually get this where people can actually live in there? Oh, um, I'm, I'm not the Minister of Housing. <laughs> but, and I think um, still I would say we need innovation. We need more discussions. Uh, I don't think uh, any single one uh, innovations can be the solutions or the only solutions for all the problems. I, I'll take the chance to combine with some of the um, uh, discussions that we have with the government. I think right now, globally, I see a lot of different conferences. Uh, when we come to a point uh, on social innovations, we will come on, oh, how do you scale that? How is the government come on board? Uh, how is the capital is going to play a bigger value on that? But I suspect that 10 years later, I would see that there will be less questions around that. We all need to adopt to a new world to come, a new system, new, not new, the new world. <laughs> but I think it's, um, we don't just expect government would be the only one can solve big problems. So we have been trained for too many years that we rely on them to be the single source of solving our problems, public housing, public welfare. But I would say increasingly what David observed about the politics, about the, how we trust the government. I think it's increasingly difficult for us to treat them as the, the only stakeholder when we talk about social change. So one day in the bigger conference, I would say there will be many more different discussions on scaling impact, finding solutions. I could foresee that the younger generations will come one day. Their value system is totally different from our generations. So they will take over one day. So by that time, the whole discussions will be different. But I think at our generations right now, some younger ones here, but I think we have the responsibility to pave, to pave the way better for these generations to come. So we need to invent solutions. So apart from individual ideas, I would say it's equally important for us to discover infrastructure innovations, the new ways of reassemble resources, the new way of working with the government, policy makers, the new way of aggregating innovation together. One example SHK is trying now is to try to support a lot of initiative, even we have not invest, uh, invested or incubated. So we launched some um, consortium. Social good, good SPO, social purpose organizations, work on good thing. These change makers to, should come together, be it education. We get 10 top change makers that all good reputations. They all work on good things, but they work in silo. Why don't we gather them together? Like what David is doing right now. Food tech, right now globally, the top guys are all together. They are friends. They are not just partners, not just business partners. So they will compare notes. They will share information. So collectively, we are promoting a movement. So we have to go beyond our own entity. So with this habit, way forward 10 years later, there will be a lot more ways to reassemble things. So by that time, we also manage our expectations already. Oh, government can come on board when we are welcoming you. But I think you are not the only one can influence a lot. Because we already plug in all these innovations together. We pick up a bigger group. Right now, we are advocating in Hong Kong, apart from just waiting for someone to quit their job to be a social entrepreneur, which is quite hard, you get to know. Can we change the startup people? When they are doing startup, can they add social flavor into it? Business people, can they plug in impact as one of the things that will, they will think about? Adding purpose back to the business. We call it business 2.0 movement. All these will lead to one day, th the efforts could converge together. So right now, I think in the next 10 years, Apart from focusing in finding new solutions for the problem, I think we have to find new ways for us to, for us to collaborate together again. I think the root cause of the root cause, one of those, is we are live in silo. Sectors don't talk to each other. So we all have barriers to working with each other. So I think that's something we need to address as well. Uh, I come from finance background, um, so in terms of stakeholder analysis, uh, so we talk about founders, investors, 
in the social enterprises in a sustainable way. Uh, so, for example, most of the social enterprises, who are the founders behind the, the ventures? Are they uh, donors or or for profit? If you know, it's below market profit, uh, below market return, or is it an at market return? And the second question is, uh, what, what what's your view on the future of uh, impact impact investing uh, in this region? It's going to be a much bigger scale, in your view, in the next say five to ten years from, from here. Thank you. But that. that Why, why? Uh, um, uh, social venture, of course, the, the range is very broad. It's a very broad spectrum. So um, depending on the scale of the venture itself, of course, the source of funding is very different. Um, but we, if we are talking about, for example, in the field that I work in, uh, food tech, ag tech, sustainability, absolutely it is just like all other types of investment um, is it is a field on its own. There's no reason why, from a financial standpoint, it cannot generate equal, if not better, um, return to the investor. Except it is more than just financial return; it is holistic return, triple bottom line. So environment, social, uh, and of course financial. Um, I think in Asia, for example, when a, because you asked particularly about Asia impact investing. When we were trying to pitch, um, f first of all, thankfully, we fund majority of the growth of Green Common and Omnipark. I must say, if we were to rely on outside investors or impact investors, then uh, sadly, uh, Green Common and Omnipark would not exist. Um, we had the privilege to fund the early part of it, um, in, if we were in Silicon Valley, if we were in many other parts of the world, um, honestly, you know, we would have gotten way more funding than we have gotten up to this point. But finally, now people are waking up, and uh, thanks to more success stories from around the world. So Beyond Meat being a very good example. A um, couple years ago, it was just an, a company trying to attempt to create a burger without beef. But now, this year, Beyond Meat will be going IPO. Um, so success stories is very important to convince investors um, and convince people in general that this is a field that you can do good and do well at the same time. You can generate all these returns simultaneously. So now, all of a sudden, you know, people are now calling us every day on LinkedIn, on all sorts of you know, channels. We are getting interest from all sorts of people, including investors, saying, hey, you know, we saw the news about Omnipop, we taste it, you know, how can we talk to you? Um, it's kind of interesting because by the time after the product is launched, after the news is out, that's not the time when people need money anymore. You know, you have many, many more options in terms of getting funding. Um, so it's always kind of the chicken and egg, which is who are, I mean, impact investors, I think something that is deep down, they must have a, a cause, they must have that, the impact side in them to believe that at the end of the day, if they are asking, if they must have the same financial return as other financial vehicles, then they are not genuine impact investors. They are not genuine impact investors. You got to look at the problem that these companies are trying to tackle. Um, you're not giving money away, so this is not charity, this is not philanthropy. But deep down, you got to think that, okay, I'm supporting the entrepreneur, I'm supporting the business. Of course, you don't blindly give money away, but um, you, after evaluating the team, the management, and if they see there's a reasonable chance for this team to do something impactful, hopefully they would put the money in. Because um, So anyone who... Like when we had people who say, hey, David, at the end of the day, will you generate the same financial return or if, you, if we will generate better financial return than other commercial vehicles or commercial entities? Then my answer to them is, I think our conversation can end right here. You got to fundamentally believe in what we do.
you gotta believe in David. You gotta believe in Francis. You gotta believe in whoever the management or founders of that company. Um, and this is for the long haul. If you want your money back in five years, three years, and you want 10x, um, you know, go put it in something else. Go put it in the stock market, in many other types of venture capital investing. So that is at least my answer. Uh, it may not be an answer that they, they like to hear, but um, you, because, after all, this is called impact investment. Um, so deep down, you got to have that roots belief. I invest in Beyond Meat five years ago. Before Beyond Meat had any burger or hot dog products, I look at the founder, his name is Ethan Brown. I had a very good multiple rounds of conversations with them. I met with the team. This is a dedicated team that truly want to change the world one burger at a time. Reduce beef consumption by creating better beef. Reduce people's reliance on burger by creating better burger. Okay, that was five years ago. I went around Hong Kong and say, you know, I, have, I know this company I'm investing my money in. I ask some of the richest family offices in Hong Kong and say, you know, this is a field that you can get financial return and make impact. Honestly, no one listened. Zero. Except for some of the very close friends who co-invest with, with me and us. But other than that, zero. Today, people talk to me like I'm a genius. It's like, wow, you invest in Beyond Meat since five years ago. What is your, your return now? Like 15x? I'm like, probably more than 15x. But that is because, it's not because I was counting, I was looking for that 15x. Although 15x, of course, is nice. But it's deep down, I believe this team will fix a big problem. And if a, they indeed find a solution to fix it, of course there'll be financial return. When I started Green Monday, I didn't do it because of financial reason. But do I believe that ultimately this business will, su will be successful? If we make it work, this business will be successful. And if the business is successful, financially, we'll get our return. But that's not the first thing I go in uh, when I think about it. So very important mindset is, yes, as long as you see there's growth potential, um, and you see this as a team, I hope that's the key thing that um, you know, these people will look at. Otherwise, fundamentally, I don't believe they're genuine impact investors. Um, it is just kind of the buzzword of the, of the season, right? You know, the, the, the latest buzzword that bankers throw around. Uh, oh, now we have an, an impact fund, you know, put money in and you know, it's kind of like you feel good about yourself, but um, fundamentally you gotta ask, you know, do I, you know, particularly these investors and families, do they want to allocate a portion of their wealth besides business, besides investment, besides philanthropy? Kind of a new way of um, capital allocation. Do I have time to quickly address we, this? No, we, uh, we, 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 I've just been very kindly informed that we actually have 15 more minutes oh, left, okay. so, so we can go right. until 11.45. Um, so I think first, uh, I, I get two parts for this answer. First part, I would say uh, right now what we are mobilizing more would be the philanthropic dollar rather than the investment dollar. So I think more family offices are seeing that, oh, they do philanthropy before. But family, always, family offices also do investments. So they will see that why not uh, making it more efficient to treat it in a way that we can uh, make some social enterprise to be successful so they could sustain their impact. So I think it's more like that. Uh, first of all, it's because of scale. And secondly, it's, I think um, it's much easier, as David said, to uh, talk to them in the same language uh, at this stage. But I think we should be proud of Hong Kong. We have um, David and Green Monday. All the way walk through from social first, going to the investment side. So I would somewhere, somewhat compare, uh, like professional, Professor Mohammed Yunus, get microfinance, really, in this um, 20 or 30 years, from really a social thing, going into the mainstream. I think that's very important outliers. We all have to embrace to showcase to the world, get the attention from the mainstream, get CNN to cover it. It's very important. But I would say it takes too long to wait for the hero. We take decades already to wait for the hero to come to save us. I think uh, it's no longer effective. We cannot just wait for the next David to come. Five years or 10 years is too long. So we have been doing that for 10 years. 
I, I failed. I have to agree. I, I have to admit on that. So I think right now, in terms of impact investing, what are we are advocating right now, uh, if you want to leverage a bigger scale thing, we cannot just sit here and wait. We, right now, we have more money than ideas, totally. So we have to spend more time in the field, getting more people come on board in the research on the field, what, is, what kind of innovation we need. We spend more money, um, grant base to discover it. But at the same time, we need to find ways, as I said. Business 2.0, we are advocating getting the corporate to form corporate social ventures. Can we get the business to spin off social business arms? So uh, B Corp is everywhere. Base of the pyramid, creating shared value, all these kind of trends is pointing to getting the business to work harder. So I think uh, we even in Hong Kong, we're trying out to form uh, impact business, which is like a joint venture with the business people. So we can leverage their network and expertise in a much faster way. So they, we don't wait for them to quit their job, to start from scratch. We form direct relations with their business. So in that way, we can solve the part of the problem of the deal flow problem in uh, impact investing. But very important for the second part of the uh, answer, I can speak it now. Not a few days back I, when I'm at the Financial Times conference, I cannot say that. I think it's the way that we see capital. So uh, we have to see we are the guardian of the capital or we are guardian of the society of the earth. So we assume that those, more philosophically, we assume that we own the capital. But are we? So I think we need to see that many capital belongs to our world. Resources belong to all of us. So when we come to the impact investing, or whatever name you call, there will be many more names, believe me. But I think whatever we say, we see, again, like government, it's just one of the stakeholders. Capital is just one of the tiny little tools that we have to leverage in our impact game right now. So we have to get the humbleness in these things. We have to see the limitations of just having money. We cannot just repeat the capital wealth is doing in the last 100 or 200 years. Uh, I, to a certain extent, I don't want, like David, we don't want to spoil the capital owner sometimes. We, need, we don't need to just answer all the questions that we have or at the board meeting or the investments questions. We need to turn around the game. Right now, capital is work for good. It's not the good work for the capital. It's not just an alternative investment. Impact Investing World Conference, a lot of people go there for the sake of just investments. Whatever name uh, tacking on the investments, they will go. Uh, impact Investing, ESG Investing, uh, EVO Investing, they will go. But I think uh, it's just around the capital. We are repeating the game. Right now, we're not just turning around the game in plant-based thing, not just turning around the game of poverty. We are turning the game of the whole world is running. So I think how do we see capital is very important right now. I think along the journey, as I said, we need to change the way that we collaborate together. We need to break the silo. And I think it's equally important for us to have a brand new view or perspective to see capital. Uh, I think that's very important in when we talk about impact investing. Thank you. It's very touching because I, uh, I'm trying to uh, make a startup company and I try to talk to all the investors and they just ask for the money. So uh, even they think the idea is quite good or very good for the society, but the money is very important. And I talk to all the young, uh, young people around me and they just struggle to make money for support their families. They, they didn't want to uh, get rid of the, uh, get out of the circle they, they live in the daily life. So uh, actually, I'm just asking that uh, can we create more jobs for the young, uh, <laughs> sorry, the young adults? Because uh, after I joined the UN conference, I really reflect all my uh, lifestyle and what I have did before. I really want to change. But the circle is very strong and uh, just don't want to get rid of the daily life. It's very difficult. We need the support and we really need the chance opportunities to find a new job, 
to uh, make a new lifestyle and to have a brand new future. Yeah, thank you. May I ask you? May I ask your name? What's your name? Tina. Tina. Um, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> Um, we provide a lot of jobs. <laughs> We're always hiring. <laughs> um, first of all, there are, thankfully, there are some accelerators or some incubators right now, um, not just in the US, not just from other parts of um, the Western world, but in Singapore. In Singapore, very entrepreneurial as a government, but Hong Kong even. Um, there's an, uh, just, there are many, I mean, that comes to mind, but one is called Brink, B-R-I-N-C, um, and they are looking for, you know, people with bright minds and entrepreneurial spirit um, and potentially provide not just funding, but also resource and other types of help to build a company. But to get to the more fundamental question, which is getting out of the comfort zone, it is difficult. All of us, it is difficult. Young people, uh, middle age, old age, doesn't matter. I mean, it is called comfort zone for a reason, right? Um, you know, if you get out of it, it is risky. When I got out of it, when he got out of it, what, 12 years ago, I mean, people thought Ngai Wa Sing Francis is like complete idiot. Uh, when I, you know, did, started Green Monday seven years ago, people thought, you know, David, don't you have something better to do? I mean, I spend every day just asking people, eat less meats, eat less meats, you know. Don't eat meats on Monday. That's what I did for the first three years. People publicly, I mean, when we call ourselves a social venture back then, people openly questioned. I mean, they said, well, first of all, David, um, I don't know what you're doing. Second, even if they think I'm doing a good thing, at most, it is just a campaign. Green Monday, right? Eat less meats or don't eat meats one day a week. So it is highly uncomfortable. It is risky. Um, but why I put risky in quotes is because I think staying in comfort zone is also very risky. Maybe the riskiest. So there's no right or wrong answer. Some people prefer to be more live a more safe life, live a more, you know, not this type of, you know, ups and downs, but something that's more steady, more comfortable. There's nothing wrong with that. It comes down to your own choice. But as a young person or as an individual in general, once you wake up to the problem in the world, it's very hard to unlearn it. It's very hard to just say, let me turn a blind eye. Say, don't time though. It's very hard. So I think keep that spirit, keep that soul. Um, you, we, it, it is exactly that type of discomfort um, that drive us to hopefully create and innovate something new. Um, people like Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs had very rough first half of his life. <laughs> I mean, he was kicked out of Apple, actually. I think everyone knows. I mean, um, you may be too young to know. But... Steve Jobs was kicked out from his own company before he was invited to rejoin to indeed be the hero to rescue the company, which turned out to be the Apple today. So Elon Musk, every day, he's still answering a lot of questions about when his company is going to be profitable. When is he going to actually produce the Model 3 that he promised will be delivering by now? So. Being an entrepreneur or playing on the edge is never easy. Um, no one says entrepreneurship is easy. In general, social or non-social, it is tough. Um, but it is when you pursue this ideal or this you know, kind of higher meaning of life that keeps adding fuel to your tank that you just say, every morning I wake up, I want to keep doing it. So, um, you know, don't lose hope, uh, especially now you awaken to all these problems that the world is facing. Um, if you really sit down, put your, head, put your head down to work on some ideas, solution, maybe with friends, maybe with mentors, uh, maybe join a company, join SVHK, join Green Monday, uh, for example, for example. Um, I'm not going to compete with you. <laughs> um, and then get a little more experience under your belt. Um, be surrounded by people who are like-minded. 
very important. If you feel alone, okay, um, f first of all, you should not, you are not alone, and you you definitely should not feel alone. Um, back then, you know, that was 10, 12, 12 years ago. He was trying to um, talk to other people about becoming a social entrepreneur. That was difficult too. But then slowly but surely, he started to discover more and more people who are like-minded. And now, Social Venture Hong Kong has this huge platform of hundreds and thousands of people who think just like him or crazier than him. Okay, so um, chances are there are a lot of people who think the same way, so no need to feel alone. But the idea, the first thought that you want to get out of the circle of that comfort zone, that alone is worth praising. That is the beginning of something potentially awesome. I just want to echo with um, David on that. So Tina, thank you very much for letting us to see your heart. So I think as, I, as we talked about all the younger generations, they have a good heart and they're ready for take on more. But I would say uh, all the struggle that you have, I think it's just, just the first struggle. Believe us. You can, you can um, believe that uh, what David's journey, my journey, we face a lot of different journey, struggles every day. Many, many of them. But I think uh, I, would call, I would call them unavoidable struggle. First of all, you're not alone. We're all, we're all facing the same thing. But I think secondly, uh, these struggles are good for you. We talk about Buddhist value. I think all struggle came with a reason, but I think all struggle lead us to a better reason for doing something else. So I think without all these things, you will not be successful one day. So I think uh, keep that doing, but I think you are giving me hope. I know why I'm hanging on now. Uh, tomorrow, I will have a fresh day because of Tina. But I hope that really one day, we need we don't need to describe social entrepreneurship to be an X-Men movie. We don't, <laughs> we don't find each other, finding the outliers. I, I always struggle. I, I tell you something. I cannot um, convince myself why the society, our current world, reward the bankers with the most, treating the social entrepreneur to be the least. Why is that? So that's why we need to turn it around. If we keep on spoil the capital owner, I'm sorry about that, but I think we will repeat the game. I don't, see, I don't want to see that game happening, at least in the impact world right now. So I think, can we pay people decently, but at the same time get them to work comfortably? We don't need just to rely on those heroes who can go through all those struggles. We see normal people can see doing good as, a part of, as a one decent job. People would accept. They got paid, they could support their families. Why not? I think we are hanging on, the, on this, all those Green Monday staffs, our staffs. I cannot um, face them sometimes, all the time, every year when we are reviewing. I feel bad, I can tell you, really. Because I see people get high pay <laughs> in the world, but they are doing evil things sometimes. They don't know even sometimes. But I think why our society is like that, I think that's the core of the values, the Buddhist value that we talked about today. Or, or any name that you put on that. I, I, put, I put away the label already, but I think all deep down, we, when we deep, think deeply, we all share the same value. That's the end goal that we have to collectively change it. So hopefully one day, Tina, you, you can talk to a youngsters 10 years later. Also right now, you don't have to struggle. But 10 years back, I have that kind of struggle. So I hope that will be our future world. Uh, I'd like to thank David and Francis for an amazing panel. Yeah, and thank you, Tina, and thank you to all of you for your interest, and I hope uh, maybe there'll be more conversation to come at later points, and thank you so much for the amazing work you do. Thank you so much.